to start, a little bit about us and why we care about this. Uh, Max and I are both software engineers at Stitch, which is a company that builds authentication and fraud prevention software. Here at Stitch, we care deeply about the performance and security of our auth products. So we've invested a lot of time into making sure our auth flows work as expected, end-to-end -end testing being one of the important ways that we do this. Cypress has been a super helpful tool for quickly setting up useful end-to-end -end testing for our authentication products. And while we support many different forms of auth today, Stitch actually started out as a passwordless authentication company. So next, I'll go into why you too should care about passwordless auth and how to test it. Passwordless authentication is taking over. Yes. There are many reasons to go passwordless. The main ones being that passwords create friction for the user and are fundamentally less secure due to human error. In fact, it's estimated that 82% of all online data breaches stem from easily guessed, stolen, or compromised passwords. So passwordless auth is the future. The only problem is that passwordless flows are often more difficult to test than regular password-based flows. The reason for this is that the two forms of auth require different things from the user. Password-based auth is something you know. It's a secret or string you can enter programmatically. Meanwhile, passwordless authentication is typically something you have, whether it be an email inbox, a phone number, or a physical authenticator device. To successfully build an end-to-end -end test for passwordless auth, we need to be able to walk through the entire flow and likely need programmatic access to external resources. With that said, while less straightforward, testing passwordless flows are not impossible. Today, we'll share with you how to use Cypress to test the following flows, email magic links, SMS one-time passcodes, and web author and passkeys. We'll start with how to test email magic links. Email magic links is a passwordless auth flow where the user enters their email address and a magic link is sent to their inbox. Clicking on the link redirects the user back to the site where they are automatically authenticated. Email magic links are a fantastic primary authentication factor. It's seamless one-click login and users no longer have to worry about forgetting and resetting their passwords. Magic links are also sent on each login attempt and expire after a single use. So you no longer have to worry about a bad actor getting a password and having continual access to an account. As I mentioned before, though, while email magic links are great, they are more challenging to test than a traditional password flow. For one, it's fairly complex. Your test needs to be able to send and receive an email magic link, access that link, and use it to authenticate. In addition, you also need programmatic access to an email inbox. And finally, it's time sensitive. Since magic links expire, they cannot be reused across multiple tests. So here is how we test email magic links at Stitch. To build a seamless end-to-end -end test, we use Cypress and Mailosaur, which is a service for email and SMS testing. Cypress gives us the, us the ability to headlessly click through the entire email magic link flow, and Mailasor gives us the testing inbox that we need. Mailasor also has a Cypress Mailasor package with custom Cypress commands that makes it super easy for your Cypress test to access the email magic links sent to Mailasor's inbox. As I mentioned before, email magic links can be difficult to test due to its complex flow and need for an external inbox. And as you can see here, using Cypress and Mailosaur in tandem easily solves this problem. Here's an example Cypress test that we've written to test our own email magic link flow. First, we grab the current timestamp to generate a unique Mailosaur email address. Then we type the email into the login form input and click on the submit button. Next, we use the Cypress Mailosaur custom command Mailosaur get message to retrieve emails sent after the timestamp that we created. And that gives us the email, which we can extract the magic, magic link from and easily visit using Cypress. From there, we confirm we're logged in, and then we can log back out. 
As you can see, not a lot of code necessar necessary to walk through the entire email magic link flow. And here's the Cypress UI running through the test I just showed you on our demo app. All right, moving on to testing SMS one-time passcodes. SMS one-time passcodes is another great form of passwordless authentication. You've likely gone through this flow before in your mobile apps. The app texts you a passcode and you type that passcode in, which is often autofilled in order to authenticate. SMS OTPs are super flexible. Depending on your use case, you can use them as your primary auth factor or as a secondary auth factor for higher security applications. Think like a FinTech app, for example. Like email magic links, SMS OTPs are also randomly generated and expire after use, meaning they will only work for a single login a session. With that said, testing SMS OTPs is a similar challenge to testing email magic links. Again, it's complex. You need to be able to send and receive a text message and retrieve the passcode from the SMS in order to authenticate. You also need programmatic access to the SMS OTP without a physical device on hand. And finally, they're time sensitive again. OTPs expire after a certain amount of time and cannot be reused. So how do we test it at Stitch? Once again, we use Cypress and MailSore to test SMS OTPs. Um, Cypress lets us walk through the flows and MailSore provides us with a testing phone number and inbox. We can use MailSore's custom Cypress commands to easily access the passcode from MailSore's inbox. Here's an example end-to-end -end test we've written for our SMS OTP flow. You can see here we get the current timestamp. Then we click on the phone number input and type in MailSource provided phone number and click the submit button. Next, we use the MailSource get message custom Cypress command to retrieve messages sent to the number after the timestamp we created. With that, we're easily able to extract the passcode from the text message and enter it. Finally, we confirm we're logged in and log back out again. And here is a quick Cypress UI run through of the SMS OTP flow in our demo app. One, again, even without a physical device, MailSore and Cypress make it easy to send, access, and enter the SMS passcode. And now I'll be handing it over to Max to talk about more passwordless testing. Awesome. Thanks for that, Allison. Next, I'd like to talk about testing WebAuthn and passkey-based flows. But first, let's spend a little time explaining what WebAuthn is. WebAuthn is a browser protocol developed jointly by the World Wide Web Consortium and the FIDO Alliance. WebAuthn allows websites to integrate with devices like laptops, smartphones, and USB verifiers and technologies like face recognition or touch ID. Credentials are stored on these physical devices for later use. In addition to being built on secure cryptographic primitives, one of my favorite characteristics of WebAuthn is it cannot be phished. Take SMS-based login, like Allison just showed. An attacker wanting to hack your account could direct you to a fake website, trick you into entering your phone number and the corresponding one-time passcode. They can then submit this passcode themselves and gain access to your account. WebAuthn credentials are bound to the domain they're created on. If I create a credential on, say, cypress.io, I can only ever use that credential there. It's impossible for an attacker to trick me into using that credential on another site. The browser and the WebAuthn standard won't allow it. This means that whole classes of security vulnerabilities go away with WebAuthn, and it's seen as even more secure than other passwordless authentication mechanisms. Let's talk about some basic WebAuthn terminology. There are two objects we need to care about. The first is the authenticator. Authenticators are physical devices that validate your identity. For example, your operating system, your phone, or a YubiKey. The second is the credential. Credentials are virtual private keys stored on the authenticators. Credentials are registered to the server and linked to your online account. 
The way I think about this is the authenticator is like a keychain and the credentials are like individual keys within that keychain. I take my keys everywhere, but each key only works in a single place. I can add more keys over time or remove keys I no longer need. One thing I want to circle back to is the variety of authenticators that exist in the ecosystem and what that means for us as web developers. There are platform authenticators like Touch ID, which are built into the computer. And there are roaming authenticators like YubiKeys that can move between computers. These roaming authenticators can communicate over USB, Bluetooth, or even NFC. People can use YubiKeys, phones, laptops, or other devices to log in. And these authenticators can all have different levels of interaction. Some require just a tap. Others require you to scan your finger or even your face. How do we integrate with all these authenticators? And more importantly, how do we test them? Good news. The WebAuthn protocol abstracts over all these different authenticators. We can treat them all the same. We really only need to care about the interactions between the web browser and the web application. And we don't need to worry about the physical devices at all. Those are governed by other protocols that are handled for us by the web browser. Let me take this chance to talk through uh, one of the most common misconceptions we see with WebAuthn. When you're using a, a biometric authenticator, like a fingerprint, that biometric is only between you and the authenticator. It doesn't appear on the web, and it certainly doesn't get sent to the website you're logging into. Your biometric data is safe and secure when using WebAuthn. So if your biometric data doesn't get sent to the web, what does? Let's walk through the WebAuthn registration process. First, the user will ask to register a new credential. The website backend will generate a unique challenge. Think a random string. The user's authenticator will generate a public and private key pair and use it to sign that challenge. This key pair is the credential we were talking about earlier. It's given a unique ID and associated with the web origin where the registration took place. The public key and the sign challenge are sent off to the website, where the website can check that the signature matches. The website saves this public key for future use. The next time the user logs in, the website will generate a new challenge and request a new signature. The user's authenticator can then be used to sign that challenge with the previously created credential. If the signature matches the previously saved public key, the operation succeeds and the user is successfully logged in. Now that we've covered everything we need for WebAuthn, we're able to talk about passkeys. You might have seen passkeys in the news recently. They were prominent at Apple's WWDC keynote, and earlier last week, Google made passkeys the default authentication mechanism for all users. Passkeys are a solution to one of the biggest problems with WebAuthn. What happens when you lose your authenticator? Imagine if your phone breaks or falls in the ocean or if you lose your YubiKey and can't find it. You wouldn't be able to log in anymore. This means that WebAuthn has never really found much success in consumer applications. At work, if you lose access to your authenticator, you can ask your manager or your IT admin to help you get a new one set up. But imagine if you lost access to your Netflix account or your email. You wouldn't have someone to go for and ask for help. Passkeys are trying to fix that. With traditional WebAuthn, your credentials are locked to a single physical device, but passkeys will sync between all of your devices, providing you with backups. Apple and Google will allow for syncing of passkeys both within and outside of their ecosystems. What does this mean for us as developers? From a technical perspective, it means that if we support WebAuthn, we support passkeys. It's the same standard and they're the same thing. From a business perspective, Pass keys are about to become incredibly popular, and building out support will be a hot issue in 2024. Okay, we've now talked about WebAuthn, uh, what WebAuthn is, how WebAuthn works, and how pass keys build on WebAuthn. But this is a testing conference, so it's time to get to the part we really care about, testing. How do we test this flow that requires a physical device with special hardware? Well, fortunately, the writers of the WebAuthn specification defined a way for us to do this. The WebAuthn specification has a section on virtual authenticators. 
authenticators that are defined by code and managed via an API. We can use this API in our tests. This API can be accessed via the Chrome debug protocol, and we can access the same protocol in Cypress. You've actually been using this protocol for years. You just haven't realized it yet. So this video here shows the Chrome DevTools protocol monitor. Whenever you open up Chrome DevTools and interact with the page, DevTools communicates with the page via the Chrome debug protocol. We can see all the messages being passed between the two of them, and we'll go and send those same exact messages in our tests. This also means that anything you see Chrome DevTools do is something you can do inside a Cypress test. Naturally, this means there are some limitations. This technique won't work on other browsers like Safari or Firefox. So here I have some code to run through a real WebAuthn registration flow. I've wrapped the Chrome debug protocol with Cypress commands to make it easier to use, and I've added some type definitions. All this code is available on GitHub for you to see and use. What we're going to do is enable the virtual WebAuthn environment. Next, we're going to add an authenticator. There are a few options for this authenticator, and you can read more about them in the docs but essentially we're adding a platform authenticator like Face ID. Now, whenever the application tries to verify the user's identity, the virtual authenticator we've created will automatically respond to that request and sign the challenge generated by the server. This will allow us to complete our login flow. And that's it. We also have examples and written material for more complex topics like saving authenticators and credentials across test runs on our GitHub. So be sure to check that out. Then. Back to you, Allison. Thanks, Max. Before we conclude this session, I want to reiterate a few of the key learnings that we've had from building Cypress tests to validate our own passwordless flows. First, because security is important, testing is essential for authentication. However, passwordless auth can be more difficult to test than traditional password-based auth due to their complex flows and need for external resources. With that said, Cypress is an awesome tool for writing thorough end-to-end -end tests that can walk through entire passwordless flows. And with the help of additional vendors like Mailasor, you can easily access the external resources required for passwordless methods like email magic links and SMS OTPs. Finally, want to try out testing passwordless auth yourself? Check out our demo app and example Cypress tests at github.com slash stitch auth slash Cypress 2023. It should also be linked in the resources section in this uh, presentation. This GitHub repo shows you everything you need to get up and running with Cypress in order to test all of the different passwordless methods we talked about today. And that's it. Thank you everyone for listening.